This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Early in the 20th century, Dr. Russell Conwell was touring the United States, delivering what historians have called the most frequently given lecture in the annals of oratory. Its title was Acres of Diamonds. And before he died, Dr. Conwell had delivered that lecture over 5,000 times. Following his introduction, he would step to the center of the platform and the audience, soon spellbound, would listen to these words. When going down the Tigris and Euphrates rivers many years ago with a party of English travelers, I found myself under the direction of an old Arab guide whom we hired up at Baghdad. And I've often thought how that guide resembled our barbers in certain mental characteristics. He thought it was not only his duty to guide us down those rivers and do what he was paid for doing, but also to entertain us with stories curious and weird, ancient and modern, strange and familiar. Many of them I've forgotten, and I'm glad that I have, but there is one which I shall never forget. The old guide was leading my camel by its halter along the banks of those ancient rivers, and he told me story after story until I grew weary of his storytelling and ceased to listen. But I remember that he took off his Turkish cap and swung it in a circle to get my attention. I could see it through the corner of my eye, but I determined not to look straight at him for fear he would tell another story. I did finally look, though, and as soon as I did, he went right into this other story. He said, he, I will tell you a story now which I reserve for my particular friends. When he emphasized the words, particular friends, I listened, and I have ever been glad that I did. The old guide told me that there once lived not far from the river Indus an ancient Persian by the name of Ali Hafid, he said that Ali Hafid owned a very large farm, that he had orchards, grain fields, and gardens, that he had money at interest and was a wealthy and contented man. He was contented because he was wealthy and wealthy because he was contented. One day there visited that old Persian farmer, one of those ancient Buddhist priests, one of the wise men of the East. He sat down by the fire and told the old farmer how this world of ours was made. He said that this world was once a mere bank of fog that the Almighty thrust his finger into this bank of fog and began slowly to move his finger around, increasing the speed until at last he whirled this bank of fog into a solid ball of fire. Then it went rolling through the universe, burning its way through other banks of fog and condensed the moisture without until it fell in floods of rain upon its hot surface and cooled the outward crust. Then the internal fires, bursting outward through the crust, threw up the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the plains and prairies of this wonderful world of ours. If this internal molten mass came bursting out and cooled very quickly, it became granite. Less quickly, copper. Less quickly, silver. Less quickly, gold. And after gold, the diamonds were made. Said the old priest, a diamond is a congealed drop of sunlight. Now, that is literally scientifically true, that a diamond is an actual deposit of carbon from the sun. The old priest told Ali Hafid that if he had one diamond the size of his thumb, he could purchase the county... And if he had a mine of diamonds, he could place his children upon thrones through the influence of their great wealth. Ali Hafid heard all about diamonds and about how much they were worth, and he went to his bed that night a poor man. He had not lost anything, but he was poor because he was discontented, and discontented because he feared that he was poor. He said, I want a mine of diamonds, and he lay awake all night. Early in the morning, he sought out the priest, and when he shook that old priest out of his dreams, Ali Hafid said to him, Will you tell me where I can find diamonds? Diamonds? What do you want with diamonds? Why, well, I wish to be immensely rich. Well, then go and find them, said the priest. That is all you have to do. Go and find them, and then you will have them. But I don't know where to go. Well, if you will find a river that runs through white sands between high mountains, in those white sands you will always find diamonds. I don't believe there is any such river. Oh, yes, there are plenty of them. All you have to do is go and find them, and then you have them. Said Ali Hafid, I will go. And so he sold his farm, collected his money, left his family in charge of a neighbor, and away he went in search of diamonds. He began his search, very properly to my mind, at the mountains of the moon. And afterward he came around into Palestine, then wandered on into Europe. And at last, when his money was all spent... And he was in rags, wretchedness, and poverty. He stood on the shore of that great bay at Barcelona in Spain when a huge tidal wave came rolling in between the pillars of Hercules and the poor, afflicted, suffering, dying man could not resist the awful temptation to cast himself 
into that incoming tide, and he sank beneath its foaming crest, never to rise in this life again. When that old guide had told me that awfully sad story, he stopped the camel I was riding on and went back to fix the baggage that was coming off another camel. And I had an opportunity to muse over his story while he was gone. I remember saying to myself, why did he reserve that story for his particular friends? There seemed to be no beginning, no middle, no end, nothing to it. It was the first story I'd ever heard in my life in which the hero was killed in the first chapter. I had but one chapter of that story, and the hero was already dead. When the guide came back and took up the halter of my camel, though, he went right ahead with the story and into the second chapter as though there had been no break. The man who purchased Ali Hafid's farm one day led his camel into the garden to drink. And as that camel put its nose into the shallow water of the garden brook, Ali Hafid's successor noticed a curious flash of light from the white sands of the stream. He pulled out a black stone, having an eye of light reflecting all the hues of the rainbow. He took the pebble into the house and put it on the mantle, which covered the central fires, and then forgot all about it. But a few days later, the same old priest came in to visit Ali Hafid's successor. And the moment he opened that drawing room door, he saw that flash of light on the mantle, and he rushed up to it and he shouted, Here is a diamond. Has Ali Hafid returned? Oh, no. Ali Hafid has not returned, and that is not a diamond. That's nothing but a stone we found right out there in our own garden. But, said the priest, I tell you, I know a diamond when I see it. I know positively that is a diamond. And then together they rushed out into that old garden and they stirred up the white sands with their fingers and lo, there came up other more beautiful and valuable gems than the first. Thus, said the guide to me, and friends, it is historically true, was discovered the diamond mine of Golconda, the most magnificent diamond mine in all the history of mankind, excelling the Kimberley itself the Koh Lanur and the Orloff and the crown jewels of England and Russia, the largest on this earth, came from that very mine. When that old Arab guide told me the second chapter of his story, he then took off his Turkish cap and swung it around in the air again to get my attention to the moral. As he swung his hat, he said to me, Had Ali Hafid remained at home and dug in his own cellar or underneath his own wheat fields or his own garden, Instead of wretchedness, starvation, and death by suicide in a strange land, he would have had acres of diamonds. For every acre of that old farm, yes, every shovelful afterward revealed gems which since have decorated the crowns of monarchs. And when he had added the moral to his story, I saw why he reserved it for his particular friends. But I told him that his story reminded me of one. And I told it to him quickly, and I think I will tell it to you. I told him of a man in California in 1847 who owned a ranch. He heard they had discovered gold in Southern California, and so with a passion for gold, he sold his ranch to a Colonel Sutter, and away he went, never to come back. Colonel Sutter put a mill upon a stream that ran through that ranch, and one day his little girl brought some wet sand from the raceway into their home and sifted it through her fingers before the fire. And in that falling sand, the visitor saw the first shining scales of real gold that were ever discovered in California. The man who had owned that ranch wanted gold, and he could have secured it for the mere taking. Indeed, 38 millions of dollars at that time were taken out of that very few acres. But a better illustration really than that occurred in Pennsylvania. There was a man living in Pennsylvania, not unlike some Pennsylvanians you have seen, who owned a farm and sold it. But before he sold it, he decided to secure employment collecting coal oil for his cousin, who was in the business in Canada, where they first discovered oil on this continent. They dipped it from the running streams at that early time. So this Pennsylvania farmer wrote to his cousin asking for employment. When he wrote to his cousin for employment, his cousin replied, I cannot engage you because you know nothing about the oil business. Well, the old farmer said, I will know. And with most commendable zeal, he set himself at the study of the whole subject. He began away back at the second day of God's creation when this world was covered thick and deep with that rich vegetation which since has turned to the primitive beds of coal. He studied the subject until he found that the drainings really of those rich beds of coal furnished the coal oil that was worth pumping. And then he found how it came up with the living springs. He studied until he knew what it looked like, smelled like, tasted like, how to refine it. Now, said he in his letter to his cousin, I understand the oil business. And his cousin answered, all right, come on. So he sold his farm, according to the county record, for $833. He had scarcely gone from that place before the man who purchased that spot 
went out to arrange for the watering of the cattle. He found the previous owner had gone out years before and put a plank across the brook back of the barn edgewise into the surface of the water just a few inches. The purpose of that plank at that sharp angle across the brook was to throw over to the other bank a dreadful looking scum through which the cattle would not put their noses. But with that plank there to throw it all over onto one side, the cattle would drink below, and thus that man who had gone to Canada had been himself damming back for 23 years a flood of coal oil, which the state geologists of Pennsylvania declared 10 years later was even then worth $100 million. The man who owned that territory on which the city of Titusville now stands and those Pleasantville valleys had studied the subject from the second day of God's creation clear down to the present time. He studied it until he knew all about it, and yet he sold the whole of it for $833. All three of these men had gold and oil and diamonds upon their very properties, but did not think to look for it. Oh, I learned the lesson then that I will never forget so long as the tongue of the bell of time continues to swing for me, that greatness consists not in the holding of some future office, but really consists in doing great deeds with little means and the accomplishment of vast purposes from the private ranks of life. To be great at all, one must be great here and now. Let every man or woman here, if you never hear me again, remember this, that if you wish to be great at all, you must begin where you are and what you are, here and now. And that was from Dr. Russell Conwell's famous lecture, Acres of Diamonds. And ever has it been that those who aspire to great purposes must find them where and as they are. God's will for your life begins not tomorrow, but today. In the here and the now, this very instant, God loves you with a father's love this moment. Said Jesus, some will say the kingdom of God is here or it is there. But in truth, he declared, the kingdom of God is within you. A fragment of infinity of God's very spirit indwells your mind and will lead you to life everlasting. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, said the master, and all other things will be added to you. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature. Yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A-93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>